is Chaos Cast, the Chaos Community Podcast, where we share use cases and experiences with measuring open source community health, elevating conversations about metrics, analytics, and software from the Community Health Analytics Open Source Software, or short Chaos Project, to wherever you like to listen. Welcome to this episode. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Sustain, a community of open source enthusiasts and professionals that care about the future of open source. Learn more at sustainoss.org. On the panel today are Sophia Vargas. Hi, Sophia Vargas. I'm a program manager at Google working in our open source programs office, and I'm an active member in the chaos community. And also one of the latest additions to the governing board. Congratulations, Sophia. Thank you, Derek. Very excited to be taking a more active role in the community. And Matt German Prey. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt German Prey. I'm one of the co founders of the Chaos Project, been with the project the whole time, currently on the board. Really excited to be here. And my day job is I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in the College of Information Science and Technology as well. And myself, Georg Link. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Good to be with you again today. This is the first episode in the year 2022. So we're still recording it in the old year, but this is the first episode we'll release in the new year. So I'm excited that we're back. And yeah, I am one of the co-founders of the Chaos Project. I'm also on the governing board. I was the co-director. I just finished my two years. So Sean Goggins got elected to be the new co-director. Outside of Chaos, I am the director of sales at Biturgia. I'm the lead for the IEEE SA Open Community Advisory Group. And I also teach open source communities at Brandeis University. And today, I am super excited that we have three amazing guests with us to talk about the Ocean Project. So I'll just go ask you in order that we have here in our planning document to introduce yourself. Amanda Kasari. Hi, I am Amanda Kasari, and I'm really excited to be here today. I actually work with Sophia at Google and the Open Source Programs Office as a DevRel engineer and a researcher. And I was named external faculty to the University of Vermont Complex Systems Center in 2022. Congratulations. Katie McLaughlin. Hello, I'm Katie McLaughlin. I am also a developer relations engineer at Google, and I get to work with Amanda, and that's cool. Welcome. And John Meluso. Hi, my name is John Meluso. I am not a developer relations engineer at Google. I am the Ocean Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Vermont, where I study organizations, communication, design, and diversity in lots of different ways. So it's a great intersection with the sorts of things that you all are studying. Excellent. I'm so glad that you all were able to join us across many different time zones. Today, we're an international panel here today. So just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in open source. What was your journey? I'll open it up to all of you. My journey is probably the shortest. So I'll just go ahead and go first while they do nose goes with me. <laughs> I recognize this is an audio version, but that's okay. So I started getting into open source really only shortly before I started working at the University of Vermont. My background was in systems engineering and I did my PhD kind of at the intersection of system design and management and organizations. And I started hearing more from fairly large news bodies that there was a lot of value toward combating things like authoritarianism through things like open source. And I started to get curious through that. And so when I saw this position open up at the University of Vermont, I, I was pretty excited to apply for it. But it's really only since I joined UVM that I've started to, <laughs> to learn what open source actually looks like in practice and start contributing to it in whatever small ways I can for now and hopefully larger ways in, in the future. So it's been a gradual process, but I've learned a lot and been very excited to be part of it. I can go next because my description, I think, will be the second shortest. I don't actually remember being involved in open source 
in my undergrad, I did a lot of robotics and modeling work. And at the time, a lot of that work was just done using proprietary software. Most of that was provided by university licenses. And it wasn't until I was in grad school, that was in 2009, that I remember using Python for the first time. And that was because I was trying to set up a monitoring system for a local microgrid we were designing for a small national park. That was part of my energy electrical engineering graduate degree. So that was my first introduction to open source was debugging Python 2.4 and 2.5 to try to create web servers that opened into sockets and connected to micro devices, which was a lot of fun. I got to work with one of the comp sci students to help build up the web server and learned a lot about full stack things that now I really appreciate as being so much easier. So thank you, everybody who has ever pushed for better documentation in open source. Plus 100. Good documentation is great. I guess I'm last to go. I started working and discovering what open source was in 2013, I want to say. I was working at a job where we were developing in the open and it was very strange, but I had the opportunity to attend the Open Source Developers Conference in Auckland, New Zealand in 2013. And since then, I have been presenting at organizing open source conferences around the world. And it was really interesting looking through my emails earlier because I have an email from Petergia stamped 2015 about one of my very early talks that I was giving about building a hat rack, acknowledging non-coding contributions in open source, which is somewhat related to today's topic. Wow. It's really awesome when in open source things merge together and be like, oh, we already know each other through these channels. <laughs> so I'll ask a question for all of you. So could you tell us a little bit about Ocean? What is Ocean and how it came to be, where it's at now, like kind of the current state of affairs and what you hope to accomplish moving forward? Is this like a forever long answer that's coming or <laughs> I'm not sure? No, I think it's our team is extremely polite and giving. And I will say that I feel like the opportunity to go first <laughs> is something we like to give to each other. So Project Ocean is short for Open Source Complex Ecosystems and Networks. And it is a research project that was originally funded and started with a grant from the Google Open Source Programs Office to the University of Vermont Complex Systems Center in early 2020, which is a very fascinating time with hindsight to be starting a large research project, especially one that involves global ecosystems, how people communicate and work in asynchronous environments, how teams organize and work together, and how ideas spread. So starting in early 2020, one of the original principal investigators, and John, please help me out. I always butcher Laurent's name. How do we properly pronounce Laurent's name? Sure, it's Laurent about to show. Thank you very much. And Laurent will be the first to tell you that my French accent is appalling. Oh, so, is, Laurent, you're not alone. That's much better than I would have come up with. So one of the original PIs as a part of Project Ocean is actually an infectious disease modeler. So a lot of the work that Laurent, we initially talked about was this idea of like, how do communities form? What makes them thrive? How do teams come together? How do we look and think about open source in a way that looks like an ecosystem or a network, which has shown with the global pandemic to be a crucial question in really how we work and how this critical infrastructure supports us all. So I would say the beginning of Ocean really came about in 2019. I was working on the cloud DevRel team as a manager and had a lot of questions about open source that I really just wanted answered so that I could help justify work for my team. And started talking to other folks in Google, critically was Julia Ferrioli. So we started having some really deep discussions about work that we found was really important for open source and figuring out how we could get Google to be working with other folks on these kinds of questions, especially around thriving ecosystems. Where is risk present that we can't currently see? And this is at the same time, Nadia Eggballs, you know, doing a lot of her wonderful work on working in public. and so. 
We talked to a bunch of different folks and we found a good home and sponsorship from the Google Open Source Programs Office. So Julia was the original help co-founder for the project within Google. She has since moved on from Google and now we still work together outside on other projects. But the project came together and we found the group at Vermont who had this really interesting cross-disciplinary team where it also felt like questions and fundamental questions would not be held back by departmental boundaries, which we have seen as, and we know to be a challenge sometimes when we're working on cross-disciplinary research. So I feel like the past two years, which is the work that we've been doing as part of the pilot and growing and developing this research center and this research project have really been critical in just understanding what are the open questions around open source ecosystems? Where is information lacking that prevents us from asking questions? What are the ways we could start having that information be present in a visible and consensual way for people who are working with an open source? And how can we help make things more visible, which are not currently visible for both researchers, folks in industry in a way that benefits everybody working together? Could I ask a follow up question? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) All right. So it's a question that's a little later on the list, but I'm going to ask it now. So you mentioned ecosystems. Uh, several times in your discussion here. So could you give us an idea of what you mean by ecosystems? And it's a word that I hear a lot, and I think it means different things to different people. And I'd love to hear what you think it is. So I'll take a stab and then I'm going to ask John and Katie to take their spin on it as well. So I think the emphasis on ecosystems rather than systems or merely complex systems, I differentiate it. I think this is supported by Wikipedia. Great open source project, by the way. I I think that the difference mainly for me between an ecosystem and a system or network systems is when there's a biotic or abiotic components. And so when we start thinking about things as also having living components and processes as a part of the overall system that we have to account for. So systems in and of themselves have life cycles, which may not be dependent on organisms, which have their own life cycles. So when I start thinking about ecosystems, I do start thinking about how we have to be able to account for living beings as a part of those system components and equations. And so for me, when I'm trying to explain the different kinds of systems that open source is, I think Julian actually did run through this in a talk recently. We were talking about open source is an ecosystem. It's a complex system. It's a socio-technical system. It's a political system. There's all these different ways we can use to describe it. How do we think about that in a layered nuance and connected context to be able to really give the right analogs and frameworks to describe the problems we're trying to solve and the way that open source exists in reality and not in an oversimplified or a narrative process, which really kind of just blurs away a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve for and face. Exactly. Yes. So I really like the way that you put it there with the layers and nuance idea, I think really captures well, just how messy much of this is. We we can't break it down into a traditional isolated group of people interacting with one another in a particular sphere. And that's it. There are lots of different systems which are often interacting with each other at multiple levels and in multiple ways and in ways that I think span across traditional disciplines as well, which I think is one of the things that when I was doing some interviews with folks in, in open source from a bunch of different parts of the world and from different roles around this time last year. And one of the things that struck me through those conversations as I was asking them about the kinds of activities that they performed and where they performed those tasks was that there were spaces that were completely disjointed from each other in my mind, but were utterly and intrinsically connected in theirs. Things that had to do with business, things that had to do with outreach, things that had to do with actually performing tasks. Yeah, so these are often combined in in the heads of the people who are performing these activities and they'll perform something on GitHub that they then communicate to people on Twitter or via Slack. And they're very quickly stepping back and forth between these different information systems, these different technologies that to them, I don't think that it's really possible from a work perspective to disassociate these tools from one another. It's not like the things that you do in one space are isolated to that space alone. And 
they never interact with others. They're interrelated. And that interrelatedness is what really convinced me that this metaphor of an ecosystem, which is a metaphor in anything that is not a biological space, but is still a valuable metaphor for thinking about how everything intersects so readily with so many other layers. What I'm understanding so far is that ocean really is an attempt to get to the questions that we want to ask, think about ways that we can look at open source through the lens of ecosystems and complexes and other lenses to identify what are the individual pieces and understanding those in open source, but then also the ways that they interact and live within the whole that is our open source. And so I'm curious, thinking about this is, how have you approached this and what have you learned from it? So in chaos, we are also looking at understanding the health of open source communities. What are some things that you have already maybe early on or over time realized that you want to make sure everyone who looks at open source takes away from your work? The reason I got the original email from Batergia is because I developed a tool back in the day before Ocean existed, which was trying to show all the people who interacted with the project on GitHub that wouldn't normally be identified as a contributor with the implied air quotes. GitHub and other systems typically define a contributor as somebody who has code commits in the main branch of an open source project. And based on a lot of the research that Ocean has done and a lot of the things that I'm sure Chaos has discovered over the years, that definition is not accurate. There are so many contributions that happen that aren't code. One might call them non-coding contributions. Back in 2014, I want to say, Leslie Hawthorne wrote a wonderful blog post about hat racks, which was about a concept of, hey, let's give people acknowledgements about their contributions that weren't code. Things like, if you're part of an open source board, maybe put that as experience on your LinkedIn or Thank someone for doing that usability test on your new version of your software, things that wouldn't normally be captured in what was, at the time, the canonical source of contributors. And a lot of my work that I was doing with talks and also with my small open source project was about trying to elevate that message. And now with all contributors, this is now a little bit more common where for GitHub projects, if there are people contributing that aren't code commits that are automatically inserted into the wonderful list of contributors, they can get manually added to this list. However, that is still a very limited view of all the people that contribute to the ecosystem. There are going to be people that are missed even with those things. In the ecosystem of producers, there are also the consumers and people who use your product then feeding back into the system to improve it. And there's discussions around where that starts being a contribution. Are the people that submit bug reports, are they contributors or is it only the people that fix the bugs? What about the maintainers that only do the bug triage? What about the BDFLs? What about the communicators, the tutors, the educators? And so This is the stuff that I was working on 2016, 17. And when Amanda told me about this ocean stuff, I went, ooh, ooh, pick me. Yes, please. I have thoughts and opinions. Let me help. I like how it went from Katie saying, I have thoughts and opinions to very masterfully and expertly, by the way, convincing her that Katie is now also a code lead for the project on the Google side. So it's been wonderful working with her and seeing that pick up as well. Do I get to ask a question back to the panel? Because I want to bring up something that Katie just talked about, where we are trying to smush this idea of who gets to get associated with the project into repositories, where repositories exist to capture information, pass on changes in software 
but also are now becoming something larger than that. And I'm curious for the folks on this call as to like, how have you talked or thought about or like talked over time about how the balance between where information is kept based on where people work or on where it's observed. And so now we're trying to add more information into places because that's where things are observed at. Like this idea of atomic information around software projects and balancing out how much do you keep within a repo versus how do you allow for information to be distributed in many places that many people work, but where it doesn't get lost and you don't lose things like somebody's attribution for the work that they do. If I can take a step at that question and looking at the software that we have built within the chaos project, the approach that we have in any of them is people let them continue doing the work where they're comfortable in the tools that they're using. Let's not tweak that too much, but rather get that information into an analytics software, be it the Augur project, where we have several components that speak to the different platforms where work is being done, or Grimoire Lab. Same idea where we have Percival that goes out as the loyal knight and collects the data and reports back to King Arthur. It be used the metaphors in the naming. So that is how I see the conversation having gone in the past. What I also see is some attempts like in Drupal, we had a really great conversation on this podcast where they are tweaking the tools to better accommodate new workflows and recognizing different contributors. Adding to that a bit, I think from anyone who's been involved in any practical metrics program, for me, it's all about maintainability. And so how much can you keep in the process versus something that is overhead or manually updated? So if you're trying to keep the current source of truth, I try to put as much as possible into the actual workflow and the mechanisms that already exist versus requiring someone to go back and update the documentation because I just The more overhead you have, the less likely that it's going to stay current with whatever you're pulling from or whatever you're collecting from. So it's definitely not necessarily the most comprehensive way to collect information about things and systems. But from a practical standpoint and an implementation standpoint, it's one design principle that can at least hope to help gather more information without incurring more effort that's most likely going to be abandoned by the next person who realizes that it's not scaling well. I'll make a comment. And Amanda, I don't know if this is going to address your question directly, but it kind of comes from the conversation that has been happening. So one of the things we struggle with in the chaos project a lot is how much do we kind of tell people or recommend people what to do? And how much do we just come to where people are? And it's this weird balance of because context is so weird, changing work patterns is so weird, but yet we get asked a lot about, you know, just give me the guidance as to what to do, whatever that might be, whether it's how to do work or how to measure health. And we always just say, yeah, we can't do that because everything is so contextually specific. So I think it's a really hard question that you're asking as to how much we balance between coming to where people are and, and recommending how they work. And Neither is good or bad. We just, we struggle with this a lot in the chaos branch. While open source software today is powering critical infrastructure, the open source ecosystem as a whole is rapidly changing, facing challenges for governance, maintenance, maintainer burnout, funding, marketing, and more. Are you concerned about these things for your open source software too? Well, in the sustained community, we discuss these challenges and share solutions for how to sustain open source in the long haul. We meet once per year in person, and the rest of the time we keep the fire burning in our discourse forum. Join our conversations at sustainoss.org and sustain OSS on Twitter. As a former somewhat still active product manager and person who I used to work on integrating business projects together. I completely understand that tension of how do you find where people are and how do you introduce them to something new and the very real tension that is customization versus standardization. 
for such difficult questions as what should I care about or what is it that I should be focusing on? I think most recently, this group have been working on a project under ocean that we call ACROSS. And I always get the acronym wrong, but the idea is like the thinking about attribution and contribution in open source ecosystems. So we set the very bold goal in the beginning of this year that uh, the thing that we needed, that we all needed, just like a need in the Lorax, everyone needed a taxonomy because taxonomies are what everybody needs. And went through some community workshops and quickly discovered, I think like all of us here discover, when you're trying to standardize metadata for an entire world, that's something that either has to be highly regulated with dire consequences or it becomes this involving design process where you learn to work with people and not for them. And I've seen this with the chaos project as it's evolved over time and as guidelines and certain specifics for metrics and how that I think the documentation process you've set up for community feedback before things become recommendations really reflects this well. And this is some of the work that Katie and John and I have been working on is how do we define what is a contribution? How do we even get into this? And I will say that all three of us are very firmly against most kinds of binaries. So the idea that there is a code or non-code contribution is not something we're ever going to be moving into. But so how do we start to think about representing what is a contribution in open source and give people a list of those so they can call them out, make things more visible. Defining things in open source is a super hard problem, like capital P hard problem. Katie and I, even when we thought something was super clear, It was a point of discussion for hours with some very smart people. (laughs) Yeah, like trying to define things. I mean, we ran a bunch of workshops in mid-2021 where we originally did a call out where it's like, hey, we want to run a series of workshops. We want people to self-identify as being a contributor to open source repositories, open source events, or open source organizations. We thought that separation was pretty clear. (laughs) An event is a thing you go to. A organization (laughs) is a governing body. An open source repo is a GitHub repo. Every single group in isolation completely broke that definition. And it was amazing because we had events that were run by organizations. We had projects that weren't repos. We had organizations that were projects and events. It was chaos. <laughs> and if I may, in a really beautiful way, and I think this is something that, Sophia, you mentioned design earlier, and this is one of those really fundamental human-centered design concepts is involving stakeholders early on in processes and helping them identify the things that are of value and meaning to them and then defining things around that for those particular communities. And so I think that's what we organically saw happen out of this is that we brought people in, we had a starting point, and then it just evolved such that the kinds of playbooks that Amanda and Katie are now developing are much more organic and are designed in such a way to allow communities to do things that are of meaning and of value to them going forward. So yeah, in the chat, I just shared the chaos metric types of contributions, which is something that we spend a lot of time effectively listing the ideas that we had of how people can contribute to open source, because this conversation around what are the different ways that people contribute to our communities just keeps coming up again. And we need a place to at least start the conversation. So by no means is this types of contributions metric a definitive list or something that I would just say, hey, go use it. But it looked like, Katie, you just had a reaction to it just looking at your video feed when I shared that link. Do you want to share some thoughts? I have never seen this link before, dear listeners. This is something that Ocean has been working on trying to establish if this is a list. We've seen different types of lists. We've written papers about the different types of lists and how they break down. And if anyone is still not convinced that contributions are more than just code, this following list can help with identifying contribution types. Number one in the list, writing code. Two through what, 25 is not writing code. And the list of stuff in there, security-related activities, documentation, authorship, 
creative work and design, public relations, speaking at events. It's like there is so much stuff in that list and I'm sure it's incomplete and I'm sure that people can add stuff. But this is the kind of issues we were seeing when we were trying to work through with our workshops with possible taxonomies. It's like just because your project doesn't have these things doesn't mean it's a bad project, but your project could be doing things that wouldn't be in that list. And Amanda, spoilers? Yeah, I would say I think one of the fascinating things to me that was more about the dynamics of people and the culture of the people of open source that came together for our workshop, I will say that biased in that Katie and I asked people to join a thing And the people said yes, and we chose from lists of people. But what was really fascinating for me, like looking at like, and yes, generating these kinds of lists and trying to get people just to understand all the work that is done, is that contrary to what we can see when we use different metrics tracking collection and talking with people about what is represented publicly from their projects, The humans we talked to were so concerned about leaving anything out and they were so concerned about leaving any gaps and not recognizing or not seeing anybody who was helping and participating that when they were trying to name all the work that was done, the most challenging part was actually breaking through that concern into getting them to just start talking about the work. So I think there was a lot wrapped up in not wanting to leave anybody out or misrepresent anybody. And for anybody who's, I know for this group specifically, who've worked on metrics projects, just getting people to talk about the thing that you want to measure is really hard because they have to start giving seriously deep thought into a lot of processes or work or practices that they just kind of move through or don't think about. And it's not that they take it for granted. It's just that it's part of something that they accept with others. I can completely understand why lists are the great starting point. And then even breaking through that list is like, that's the crux of these metrics and tracking projects. It's just wanting to get people to move past the list into talking about what's being done. So I want to kind of take the conversation to this side a bit, because I think we've been having a wonderful conversation around trying to understand all the possible contexts and things that could be a part of this ecosystem. And as someone who works with a lot of metrics programs, we're always faced with the issue of what we want to see versus what we have and the things that we can count and the things that are currently uncounted due to our existing systems that we have. And I think that the work that you're doing here in terms of trying to pull out a taxonomy and and commonality and understanding and context and enumeration of these things is the beginning of that. But when I look at research and sort of, it's kind of an odd question, but I'm just kind of trying to see these two things together. So an example, what contributions count, we're going to link the report in the podcast notes, explores the various types of methods you can use to find different kinds of contribution styles. And as you're looking through the methodology of that research, fundamentally to do the research, you have to remove things from what you're counting in order to create some sort of uniform sample that you can model against. Like we removed bots, we removed duplicates, we removed parts of forks that had, we weren't really sure where things were coming from. And I'm trying to understand how we reconcile the research element where in order to actively model something and measure it, we have to restrict and create boundaries around something where we're talking in this context about how, <laughs> I see Katie's face is reacting, how we're worried about what we're leaving out. We know we're leaving things out. We know we're not counting things. And I'm trying to understand how the ocean project is balancing those kind of, I don't say they're opposites, but it's just sort of the nature of building a model and creating a data set that you can run in this context versus the information that is ugly, disjointed and filled with way too many things. Like I'm trying to understand how you approach this. Yeah, well, one of the ways that we strive to balance that is by trying to vary the kinds of methodologies that we use. And one of the things that Laurent and James Bagro, the other co-advisor for this project, have really well done with Amanda is selected people who use different methodologies. So on the one hand, we have folks who do qualitative work. We have people who go in and conduct interviews and do surveys. And we've been working on surveys with respect to, say, the all contributors 
taxonomy. And there's a larger survey that I'm working on right now that we're really excited about to see where it goes and trying to understand some of how we can understand labor in these spaces more broadly. But then we also move into some things that are about data science, are about matching things and trying to predict and understand the relationships between things. And so some of the pieces that we've been working on have to do with things like entropy, which is a physics concept that I still don't totally understand, but has to do with a number of different permutations that you can get of something and relationships between variables in a data set. But we've really mixed in a nice broad set of different methods so that we can try to capture as much as we can from different perspectives, because you do get different information from interviews than you do from just measuring with numbers. I like to think about things that are qualitative as also being data. Uh, and that's something that many social scientists will be very firm on because it's data too. It tells us things, it communicates and expresses meaning and value. It's not something you can necessarily capture in, oh, like we have this nice little number in this nice little graph. You can tell some beautiful stories. And for anybody who's ever been to a storytelling event, will tell you, you can really turn somebody's head. You can get them to deeply feel and understand the experience of somebody who's been in one of these spaces and felt like they were just completely left out of the picture. They've done all of this really detailed and difficult work only to figure out that, wait, three quarters of what I did for that project didn't receive any kind of recognition at all. And nobody has any clue that I contributed that kind of work to this project at all. So that starts raising all of these questions that Amanda and Katie have been really fond about lately around making labor visible and what it means to do that. And how can we just start with making it better? We won't be perfect, but this is one of the principles that I live by these days is trying to just improve. Let's do what we can to make incremental improvements wherever we can through whatever kind of data that looks like. There are lots of folks who are doing research on this, coming up with increasingly clever ways of displaying information, whether it's through language, whether it's through imagery, whether it's through trends over time, where there's a will, there's a way. We just need to work together to try to explore those possibilities. The one thing I would add on to that is I think our team is becoming increasingly critical. And I mean that not in the sense of judgmental, but in terms of analytically critical of when, when do reductionist methodologies potentially perpetuate harm in a systemic way? So when is it that we are potentially actively cutting out information or representation, especially of people from ecosystems who we are attempting to include more or we are actively trying to bring them in? So when we think about things like a critical user journey, a developer user journey, a maintainer's journey, how are we measuring things in a way that is collectively capturing everybody's experience and not just either a majority or a historical majority perspective. Thank you very much for that, because I think that the last thing I wanted to take from this is thinking about our listeners that might be working on metrics programs and ways to showcase things like, is my project doing well? How do I create and display metrics around community health? And I think the last point you made, Amanda, is really critical to that, especially if it's this is the data we have, we're going to show it. And it depending on how you pull it, how you query it, how you present it, generally there's always something missing. And being able to articulate what that is. And I don't need to harp on it very much. I think you said it very succinctly, but I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you so much for everything that you all have shared. I wish we had more time to keep this going. Unfortunately we are at the end of this episode. So for people who are interested and want to learn more or follow your work, where can they find you? So we do have some projects up on GitHub. We also, I know Katie and I are very active in the Twitter sphere because that's just one of the places it's easy to communicate globally and publicly. And John, what is the best way to reach you that is not GitHub or Twitter or are those? A GitHub or Twitter both work. I'm at Meluso on GitHub and at John Meluso on Twitter, I believe. Or you can reach out to me via email. I'm a good academic fuddy-duddy and use my email regularly like anybody else. John.Meluso at uvm.edu is easy enough. Awesome. Thank you. Now, we always like to end our episodes with a 
segment called value ads, where we share something that has brought value, joy, or meaning to our life recently. And I'll start us off. I have discovered Lifetime. That is a wellness and fitness center, not too far from where I live. And they offer a variety of things, just the normal gym things, machines to work out, but also the pool and slides for the kids and a hot tub and sauna and steam room. They have a climbing wall and squash courts and basketball. So for the whole family, we were able to go there while my family was in town and there was something for everyone. And we just had a really good time staying active and spending good time together. So that is something that has been really valuable this past week for me. Well, I'll go. <laughs> so before we started the podcast, we were talking about places to visit in Colorado. So I'll just give my pick here, which is a couple of really great places in Colorado. If you haven't been, Rocky Mountain National Park, a little bit crowded sometimes, but if you can catch it in the right time of the year, it's totally worth seeing. It's absolutely spectacular. Gunnison National Park, they have some beautiful canyons in that area down in the southern part of the state. And if you're in the south as well, go to the Great Sand Dunes. It's the largest sand dunes in North America, actually, kind of surprisingly situated right in the middle of snow-capped mountains. So head out that way. I'll go next. It's a simple one. Recent discovery and learning, a concept coming out of biology. And I think this discussion around ecosystems kind of brought me back to it. It's the concept of an emergent property, which is now a discussion that's happening in biology, which I'm going to read a definition online. So hopefully it's the right one. Uh, emergent properties refer to properties that are entirely unexpected and include emergent phenomena, materials, and emergent behavior in living creatures. They arise from the collaborative functioning of a system, but do not belong to any one part of that system. And I think what we've been talking about today and the mission of ocean and all these sort of various aspects of it in my head, it just kept coming back to, it's an emergent property. So I don't know how much you want to keep that biology metaphor in place, but I, I think that you can really go far with it. I can go next. So speaking of emergent property, Sophia, I love when things surprise me or come up over time. And in a world of what feels like a lot of recent book bans in the United States that make me quite sad. I've been casually trading books off of a reading list with my oldest child. And the reading list is the Vermont Golden Dome books. So every year, a group of children's librarians and school librarians get together in a committee and create a list celebrating excellence in children's literature. And the list is usually geared toward grade four to grade eight. But I find that a lot of middle grade books, especially contemporary middle grade books, can be so challenging and revealing for a lot of hard issues in a way that talking about like non-reductionist, but also very nuanced presentations. And so... These are designed in a way to see students read them and then they vote on the winner for the list every year. And we've just been getting books from the library, trading them back and forth. She casually leaves them on my desk as a way of communicating like, hey, you should read this. Don't always talk about it, which is fascinating for this age group. But in a way of like, either I thought of you or this is something that inspired me. And that's been quite lovely. Speaking of books, one that's currently brought me a nerdy kind of joy is Sea Python Internals by Anthony Shaw. I am very nerd sniped by this book, but the author does a really good job of using a fundamental shared understanding of Python to describe C, which is another one of my special interest topics about shared knowledge centers and translating concepts using common foundational knowledge. So like a lot of different types of developers will learn SQL for various reasons. So how do we use a basis of SQL to teach about object orientation, that kind of stuff? It's very good. I'm partway through. I might be finished by the time this podcast gets released. I don't know. And I'll go last with my no less nerdy suggestion of Catherine D'Ignazio and, and Lauren Klein's Data Feminism, which has been one of my favorite books over the past year and is one that we as a group have been really inspired by and have spent a lot of time thinking about and working through just because of how beautifully they lay out the meanings and the importances of really understanding things like where your data comes from, how you can construct data sets in ways that are meaningful and achieve the kinds of things that you actually aspire to achieve. 
and ways to make sure that it, it's inclusive in a way that helps everybody be seen and be visible in these groups. So highly, highly recommended data feminism. I think it's mostly still on hard copy, which is a little tricky for those of you who have a tight budget, but we'll find a way. I'm sure that there are ways you can find a way to keep a copy if you need to. There is an open access edition, John. That is genius. Go grab yourself a copy in some fashion. Awesome. Well, this has been a real pleasure and joy. It is time to say thank you. So thank you, Amanda, Katie, and John for joining us today. Thank you for having us. This has been wonderful. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yay, Matrix. And thank you, Matt and Sophia, for being panelists today. Thanks for having us. It was great to be here. Thanks, everybody. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us today. To stay up to date on future episodes, subscribe for free to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. If you have ideas for future episode topics or would even like to come on as a guest, please email us, podcast at chaos.community. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, your chaos community.